Let us go on with Victorian greats. Um, while Dickens acted as a committed writer who clearly took sides, the attitude of William Makepeace Thackeray is that of a spectator standing above the fray to contemplate the world with ironic detachment. Born in India with an Irish wife and with a long experience of continental life, Thackeray spent a lot of time in France and had even been an art student in Paris. Dickens's rival is in fact wholly different, perhaps not as universal and powerful, but more uh, subtle at times, and with a greater talent for satire without comment. And this is obvious in his masterpiece Vanity Fair, 1848. This is the epic story of a formidable Regency adventurous and social climber, the immortal Becky Sharp. The same passion for telling a life story while smiling wryly at the deceptive mechanisms and hypocrisies of the society surrounding the hero can be found in contemporary satire with the newcomers as well as in past reconstruction with, for instance, the uh, history of Henry Esmond, which is supposed to take place in the 17th century. With less distant humour, perhaps with a grudge, he, he stemmed from a decayed family of baronets, and definitely with a more parochial perspective, we have Anthony Trollope. Now, Trollope had the great idea of creating the fictional county of Barsetshire for a series of delightful satires on the Church of England and small-town country life in general. So we have six chronicles from 55 to 67, uh, including the best one, uh, Barchester Towers. Barchester, of course, being the imaginary capital of Barsetshire. Uh, until the end of his life, he wrote very pointed satires on other microcosms. Uh, for instance, a constituency ridden with corruption in Ralph the Air which was based on his own unsuccessful attempt to become an MP. Uh, likewise, inspired by recent financial scandals, there is The Way We Live Now, um, perhaps the crowning piece of his, uh, of his work. In the same line, hard-hitting on specific themes, with a serious documentary preparation. And by the way, he was a great admirer of Zola's uh, dossiers. One must mention Charles Reed. Uh, he is the author of a widely admired historical novel, The Cloister and the Hearth, but somehow he does better in prefiguring the roman à thèse. Uh, yet his satirical wit is uh, much more prominent than any kind of preaching. Maybe that's a major difference with Zola. Uh, for instance, in the rambling but still interesting and robustly cynical uh, Hard Cash, 1863. Another Victorian great is George Eliot. Now, though many of her novels take place in the provinces, there is nothing small about George Eliot, i.e. Marianne Evans. She was a voracious reader from childhood onwards and simply a woman with brains. She had long opted for strict rationalism and was ready to defy Victorian conventions. Having translated David Strauss' uh, Life of Jesus, she befriended a radical publisher, John Chapman, who entrusted her with the editorship of the Westminster Review. Now, as a woman, this was um, extraordinary. And of course, as you may understand, she, well, felt more comfortable using a masculine pseudonym, George Eliot. From 54 onwards, she shared the life of critic and philosopher George Henry Lewis, who was already married, so again, this was quite a step to take for somebody aspiring to remain a respectable woman. This resolute social boldness mirrors her rational and optimistic outlook. She transfers it to the heroes of her novels. George Eliot was convinced that the destiny of an individual depends on his free will, and like the destiny of nations can be shaped and even corrected. Apart from The Mill on the Floss, which is centred on love, her novels focus nearly entirely on the careers of bold individuals attempting to transform their lives and their surroundings. 
though they often end up being transformed by them instead. Paradoxically enough, George Eliot is a great painter of rural life and small towns, especially with Adam Bede and the one I, cons I consider personally to be her best one, which is Middle March. Only her last novel is international in outlook and deals with individuals operating on the same intellectual and social level as the author. Uh, that's Daniel Deronda, 1876. This was the mid-Victorian period. Now let's move on to late Victorian trends. <clears throat> now before we deal with novels of any kind, we have to mention the rise in the importance of critics. Allowing for a transition to late Victorian novelists after so much information already delivered, I will now turn to three highly representative figures of the critic. That's another Victorian specialty. Uh, not strictly speaking, an art critic though undoubtedly uh, John Ruskin, for instance, was one, or not strictly a book reviewer, though Walter Pater certainly did review books. Um, not only an expert, Arnold, Matthew Arnold, was definitely a schools inspector and an expert in the field. Um, not really a philosopher, not a politician, let us say an artist. All three names I have mentioned were artists in their own right. But an artist with enough academic credentials, all three of uh, those men had these credentials, and a sufficient aura among the intellectual elite to exert considerable influence on arts, letters, and more, as a critic, as a book reviewer, as an expert, as a sort of philosopher, maybe for some almost uh, as a sort of political force. Now this was exceptional in the Victorian era and um, such level influence was never reached again in later eras. Many tried to resuscitate this position in the 20th century and to reach that level of influence on all the levels I have mentioned but they never succeeded, really succeeded. No, no. Um, so First one, John Ruskin. Ruskin had a private fortune which enabled him to devote his whole life to the visual arts. Painting and drawing himself, he also developed uh, into a full-blown art theorist, applying ideas derived from his evangelical background. Again, definitions in the footnotes. To uphold the principle of moral value in art. That's the key idea. For him, art has to have a moral value or it's completely worthless. Therefore, he rejects nearly all Western art productions as decadent from the days of the High Renaissance. After Raphael, for instance, Ruskin considers that painting has lost its way into artificial formalism. It no longer conveys moral Christian values via organic simplicity and elevation as it had done in the Middle Ages. By organic he meant that the art production was necessarily produced by the social body as a sort of uh, natural production, you know, like, like a, well, like an apple comes to the apple tree. He thought that prior to the High Renaissance, art was the organic production of society. And then there was decadence. For him, few modern exceptions are allowed. Turner, of course, and the pre-Raphaelites, whom he initially sponsored. And for him, these exceptions pointed the way to a possible restoration he was calling for. Now, even though the pre-Raphaelites actually uh, broke up with him, and even though his character was somewhat erratic, to say the least, Everybody in Victorian England respected the author of number one, Modern Painters, number two, The Seven Lamps of Architecture, and number three, The Stones of Venice. Ruskin was also a master of English prose. The second one I have to mention is Matthew Arnold. 
He was also a poet, and we'll mention him as a poet later on, in the same way as we will mention the Pre-Raphaelites again. He was the son to the great educational reformer of public schools, Dr. Arnold. He was a poet, as I mentioned. He was also, as I've already mentioned as well, inspector of schools. Now, the Foster Education Act of 1870, uh, which created secondary state education in Britain, was uh, named after his brother-in-law. And in fact, he, it owes much to his uh, efforts. He was also a scholar himself. Arnold was a great essayist who spent his whole life defending the ideal of high culture almost as a sort of new religion, the religion of culture, somehow to replace waning Christian faith and to fend off threatening anarchy. In his Essays and Criticism and in the most important of his books, um, Culture and Anarchy, 69, Arnold famously analysed society in terms of three classes. The barbarians, i.e. the upper classes and aristocracy, only enjoying wealth and power, quite uninterested in real culture beyond decor and entertainment. Then the Philistines, i.e. the middle classes, afraid of culture and repelling it as pointless, profitless and unpractical. And finally the populace, i.e. nearly all the rest, the great unwashed, to use that famous phrase by Lord Lytton uneducated, potentially violent, positively encouraged in this by drink, and more modern methods of stifling their intellectual development. Grinding work, cheap papers and literature, cheap propaganda, stupid advertising. Yes, already, Matthew Arnold was a great pioneer in fighting advertising, and even betting or collective sports. Now, however quixotic we might find this defense of sweetness and light, this religion of culture, well, it still has some resonance uh, today, I think. Finally, I have to mention uh, the arch aesthete Walter Pater, who exerted a massive influence on a whole generation of late Victorian Oxford undergraduates, some of whom, uh, for instance, Oscar Wilde, he tutored at Bracenose College. He was a great master, another one, of prose, a great writer of essays, and what he called imaginary portraits, that is, uh, let's call that short stories about historical characters seen from the inside. The equivalent in prose of the, you might say that, yeah, typical Victorian poetic format of dramatic monologue. We'll discuss that in the next lecture. Now, Pater heralded the heydays of aestheticism with his seminal collection of essays, Studies in the History of the Renaissance, another key book of the era. Matthew Arnold, Culture and Anarchy, Pater, Studies in the History of, Rena of the Renaissance. So a series of essays, technically about the Renaissance and other subjects, so art mainly, but going much, much further. It contains a preface with uh, an incredible purple patch I have quoted here, but this is a long, long lecture and, I, and we don't have time to read it, sadly. Rejecting utilitarianism, uh, but also mid-Victorian moral constraints, and then pushing it uh, to the heights of a sort of intellectual ambition. Well, some might call it hedonism or simply uh, pose. You'll agree or disagree, but definitely uh, a, a master of English prose and a great mind. Many other thinkers, British and foreign, obviously exerted an influence on late Victorian literature, prominently philosophers such as Herbert Spencer, but really I have no space to deal with him or to all the other ones, uh, John Stuart Mill and, you know, um, I, plenty of other important people. I mean, even Karl Marx after 1848 lived in London and had a great influence, but we, we don't have uh, space for this. So I have just quoted those three great critics, Ruskin, Arnold and Pater in chronological order. So 
As you may guess from the last two essayists I have uh, quoted, the cultural atmosphere had shifted somewhere in the middle of the 1860s. As usual, and as Walter Pater often repeated it in his analyses, natura nil facit per saltum. Nature does not operate with leaps. It always works in a continuum. Things do not change overnight, but in the course of time. The efficiency of the compromise solutions supporting mid-Victorian values at the outcome of the hungry forties had, become, had begun to fade as new realities emerged, often consequential to the very solutions themselves, perhaps previously imagined to last forever. Well, again, since I have no space in this already very extensive lecture to explain these changes in detail, I'm referring you to a uh, specific fact sheet I'll, uh, I'll send. It's an uh, extract from my uh, master's seminar on Victorian uh, values.